What is church hurt? And how can we combat it? Consider this conversation ignited. <laughs> And I'm Aaron Patterson, and, and we're, we're from, from the, we're from the SJC. SJC. Today we have an incredibly interesting episode. We're doing an interview with a good friend of mine, Ben Creer, uh, who used to be a pastor and is currently working at a wedding venue. Super like, cool guy. Yeah, super close to here too. Um, so I'm incredibly excited about that. And it's a car interview, our second one. And the SJC got us new cameras for the car interview, so it's all like Sorry. pretty and stuff. Also, and, like, we don't have to wear masks. No mask. Oh yeah, we don't have to wear masks because we all got vaccined, vaccinated, and and on top of that, Ben had COVID within the last three months, so we got permission not to wear masks. Uh, but before we hop into that interview, which is gonna be awesome, we're gonna toss it to Cass really quick, put together a little package for us. Take it away. <laughs> Do you know anyone that's left the Adventist Church and why they left? I do know a couple of people and the people that come to mind right now, they've left because they are a part of the LGBT movement or group and they don't feel very welcome in the church spaces that they are in. I do. The biggest reason is because they they really wanted to um, stay because they liked the community and they did believe in God, but it was mainly the church members who pushed them away. It was um, mostly about judgmental stuff and instead of like what they kind of did is they didn't just like come up and say hey this is what we've seen and we've noticed this is what's happening you know this is not okay they just kind of blatantly like just um, reprimanded them they didn't say anything they weren't in you know, reasoning or anything like that and they were just really mean and so they just they had enough of it and so they just left the church and how does that make you feel it saddens me i mean i accept them fully who they are and i would love them to still be a part of our life but at the same time, I can understand where they're coming from, and I would love them to be a part of the church and a part of the community still, but it's really down to them, so. Personally, it makes me a little sad, but not like, I guess I'm more concerned than sad. I, I, I think that for me, like, people who are in the Adventist church are probably there intentionally at for some point, you know? It's, it's not always just like a, most people don't just grow up and then stay in the church their whole life just because they probably choose to baptism and all that. It makes me feel like a lot of the church nowadays that I notice, especially when it comes to like older generations and younger generations, um, most of it is like judgmental. And um, it just makes me feel like there's a lot more we can do. And it makes me feel like there's like, we're not really showing Jesus in the way we're supposed to. We're just kind of trying to project this image of a church that we want where that's not what it's supposed to be at all. Is there anything you think the Adventist Church could do to show God's love more? You know, I think um, God clearly lays out like how to display His love like throughout the Bible. You know, and I think it's not so much like um, God's problem, but it's just like you're always going to have a couple bad apples, you know, in like whatever religion you go to. Then it's just sometimes it just happens to be that they're more in some church and more in the other. But I feel like a lot of times, as long as we stick to what the Bible says and like meet people where they're at and like come from a place of love, I feel like we can always bring in more people into the church rather than push them away. Pray a lot, honestly, because God should be the center, not the church, and people should accept that um, they're like it's not going to be perfect. There are going to be problems, but the community that a church is supposed to be is to help each other through it all, um, not just to like say, "Hey, this is wrong." You're supposed to be there. You're supposed to be a brother. You know, it's all over the Bible, especially the New Testament that you're supposed to be there, help them through that, you know, like get down in the dirt with them and help them out of their situation instead of just telling them what to do, you know, be more like Jesus, show love. I feel like when we say the Adventist church, it's like, it's so broad and it's really hard to make changes like that, that are that big. Um, but I think, hmm, I think if like each church in itself were to focus more, um, 
on asking about how, how things that we say make people feel. If we were to sit down and listen to others, even if it's uncomfortable, even if what they're saying is not what we want to hear, I think that would help us better understand how people are reacting to what we say that we think is out of love or we're just trying to like be clear about the truth. Um, I think that would make a difference. We were to listen to people and see how their experiences have shaped them. Today we have Ben Creer with us, Pastor Ben Creer. Uh, how, how did I meet you for the first time? Was it through Acro? Um, I believe it was when I was preaching a sermon and I was distracted because there's like this charming, handsome young man <laughs> in, the off, off, in the audience and I forgot point number four. And then I, I walked in, right? And then I was like, hey, my name's Aaron. And, <laughs> and that was some other time. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember, uh, I remember going in and watching you preach once or twice and I mean everything seemed very on the outside um, I mean watching you preach everything seemed to go really smoothly mm -hmm. the sermon was awesome still remember every word of it mm -hmm. no, um, right. thank you very much yeah I oh, can't remember which one but... ask for your notes later oh <laughs> was it the one I found love no don't do that oh yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah that was a good one yeah that was a good one I like that one too preaching about the mark of the beast or... <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was something topical <laughs> and then it was like go oh. Yes. That is by design. Uh, pastors are very good at projecting. Hmm. Everything is great. Everything is normal. Everything is okay. Don't ask too many questions. Hmm. Um, got really used to that. Yeah, still trying to shake that habit, actually. That's interesting mm -hmm. because, I mean, obviously this is uh, a super, I mean, personal conversation for you also almost for me in a different way because... I know all, all the people in this car, we love the Adventist church. I want to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. um, we love the Adventist church, not necessarily everything inside of it. Mm -hmm. um, but we love what Adventism is supposed to stand for. Mm -hmm. um, correct, correct, correct. So, I mean, what, what, what in brief kind of stuff was going on that sort of led you, I mean, to, to where everything is now? Well... I decided to become a pastor when I was much younger than you. Mm -hmm. I think I wanted to start going that direction at the age of like 17 or 18. So I think what happened was when my idealism, dreams, hopes, and assumptions mm -hmm. about what a job is reconcile with the painful side of reality current circumstances and things out of your control when those things reconciled in my life it was um, it created some conflict and it mm -hmm. appeared that some of my assumptions about what ministry would be were not right when I actually got into it and that led to a really unsustainable lifestyle mm -hmm. um, just so happened that the way the bad parts of ministry, I think everyone assumes they're there and that you can just kind of compartmentalize and set them aside. I know a lot of pastors are good at that. Mm -hmm. And you gotta be. Every job has that. It just so happened that the way my personality works and a bunch of other um, aspects of my life, I guess, made the negative a lot more heavy mm. than I think it might affect someone like yourself grew up with a dad as a pastor, so you've seen a lot of it. I grew up as kind of a pastor's kid. My dad planted two churches, so I've seen a lot of it. Um, but I don't know. There's Maybe it's the rebellious side of me. Maybe <laughs> it's the millennial in me. We're always messing things up. <laughs> There's some part of who I am as a person that didn't take to the negative side of ministry very well, mm -hmm. which, unfortunately, unless people like me be really transparent at risk of being pessimistic tell you you don't understand until you're in it mm. which is the hard part they only tell you the good stuff and you only really see the good stuff right right I didn't <coughs> spend a lot of Sabbath mornings up front at the pulpit being transparent with everyone in the church about how bad things were mm. behind closed doors so that's not really what I'm supposed to be doing mm -hmm. so it's it's easy for people like me who grew up in the pew, always hearing the good stories, 
the breakthroughs in faith, the baptism stories, the stories of mission groups and mm -hmm. miracles happening. Um, that's what I dwelled on. And I thought, wow, what better to build a career that's centered around people having these wonderful, amazing experiences. Um, but then, yeah, got into it and realized that's there. I thought it would be like that's 80% of my life and then 20% is just kind of the stuff that you don't like to do. Yeah. The meetings and the, the conflict resolution and the endless committees. So, uh, would you ever consider going back into ministry having the background that you knew? Or some of the, yes. the ins oh, Really? I consider it. Well, I gotta plan a church tomorrow then. <laughs> Here's the problem. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about this since we talked yesterday about what we're talking about today. I think the biggest rub, because I feel like my, whether you call it a failed attempt at ministry or a graceful exit, transition into something new, abandoning of calling or following God's calling elsewhere, hmm. there's a lot of ways you can package that. Hmm. But at the end of the day, it was death by a thousand cuts. There's a million little tiny things that made it kind of unbearable, mm. but nothing I could say all of them to you and no one of them would sound that bad. But when you add it all together, then it became a thing. That can oftentimes be a lot harder. Yeah. It's harder to know where to draw the line. Right. And it's harder to, harder to gain empathy mm. when you want to tell someone what you're going through. You can't just say, I got diagnosed with this thing. It's yeah. just this one thing. Yeah. It's, oh, there's 403 <laughs> things that have frustrated me in the last two years. You were saying? I was saying, what's the point of me being a pastor? And like, I'd be curious what you think, because you're considering ministry on top of other things. And like, every job has its main purpose, and a bunch of little things. Mm -hmm. So my assumption was, before I even ask you what your thoughts are, my assumption was my main job as a pastor is to take Jesus and gospel into places Jesus and gospel did not pre-exist. Hmm. Or to move someone along the spectrum from not hearing or knowing about God to being angry about him to being indifferent, open, and in love with him. And just pushing him in that direction. And I was prepared for that. Yeah. I studied about it and did sermon prep like Greek and Hebrew and I studied the Bible and I Which is hefty. theology. That's, it's a hefty load. It's easy to yes. say I did theology, but there's so much stuff in there. Mm -hmm. So I did all that. <clears throat> Preparing for that. Mm -hmm. And I think the single biggest disappointment to me in ministry and something that took me five years of hoping was different and then just finally having to say, you know what, I guess this is just the way it is. It's, it seems like my role was rather service to the saints keeping mm -hmm. keeping God's people happy and that's really impossible yeah you can only choose a good 70 80 percent of people to make happy at once um, if you want to make everyone happy you just have to constantly be changing things so everyone's happy some of the time mm -hmm. or you choose a direction and go that direction, and then some people are happy all the time, and some people are never happy. Um, most of my time over the week, you know, anywhere between 30 and 70 hours a week, pastor schedules are really hard to nail down. <laughs> but a good majority of my time shifted from service of the sinners. I don't really believe in that, but let's just say saints and sinners. Instead of majority of my time focused on those folks, which is the easy part. Yeah. Jesus is real and he loves you. Mm -hmm. And everything and you've heard about part, him the most is rewarding part. wrong and that's a good thing and yeah. here's why. And I like that part. Mm -hmm. That's rewarding. It's fun. Um, but most of my time shifted to where most of my days were spent in service of the saints. Listening to just one more person annoyed at just one more thing. Mm. about me or ministry or church or whatever and I realized at the end of the day I just felt like a big babysitter mm. taking care of adults and making them happy and doing things their way and then negotiating between adults you can't talk to each other 
we disagree about what way to do it and it becomes my job to figure it out and I didn't like that so much. I didn't go to school for that. I, f I feel uh, a particular burden towards people like you who consider ministry to not change your mind. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I feel like it would be a disservice to only tell you the good. Hmm. And I feel like the best people who are entering into ministry understand the good and why they're doing it. And they also have a very clear understanding of the bad and a plan in place to solve it and know that based on your personality and your skill set and all the things that you can still continue to be a healthy individual, a good uh, spouse, the rest of you watching, <laughs> and, a good, and a good father and a good friend, despite all the frustrating things about mm -hmm. ministry. And I didn't go into that. I went into it with a pipe dream. I was gonna be having Bible studies with people every day, mm -hmm. and I go to bed every night thinking, "Oh, I brought one more person to the Lord," mm -hmm. and it wasn't like that, and I wasn't prepared for it. And when the bad hit me, it wrecked my life, and it was disappointing and frustrating. So yeah, you're considering getting a ministry. That's when I feel like, you know, at risk of being pessimistic because I don't want to be that person. But I feel like it's important to really understand how bad things are. Mm -hmm. And I love the Adventist Church. Yeah, it hasn't served me really well um, professionally. You know, like I dedicate a lot of time and energy to try to make a career out of it in the last yeah. only a few years. Maybe that'll change soon. I hope it does. Um, but it's my home church. I grew up in it, and I plan to raise my kid in it. Mm -hmm. And I currently attend an Adventist church. I haven't given up on the denomination, but the denomination has a lot of warts. And I feel like a part of paving a good future and fixing these problems is to spend a little bit of time sitting in them and understanding them and talking about them and being transparent about them. If we created a culture, maybe that's your answer. You asked the question before, how do we fix it? What if we had a culture where we could be open and real about church hurt and where we've messed up in the past corporately as, mm. a, as a church, capital C, um, but also on the local level, just having great empathy for people who have been hurt and struggled. And, and then it became a culture where our, our path forward was one of trying to not repeat the sins of the past. Hmm. And it sounds suspiciously like what I was complaining about before with church being service of the saints. But the thing is, the negative side of service of the saints is what creates church hurt. I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming in and helping us with the the final episode ever. The ultimate. Of Ignite. I know the, the ultimate. Who is the, the pinnacle? Ultimate? Huh? Who is the penultimate? Who's the, the most recent one? Uh, President <laughs> Smith. Wow. <laughs> yeah, of the USA. President Smith, thank you for paving the way for <laughs> me. For, <laughs> for Ben. <laughs> Random dude. It <laughs> was the actual finale uh, <laughs> of Ignite. Thank you guys so much for watching our very last episode so of sad. this season. Yes, very so sad. sad. Um, but yeah, just thank you for being being with us on this journey. I thank swear, I can Thank you for being speak. on us with this journey. journey Anyways, journey. thank you so much for for your views and all your support. <laughs> Special thanks again to Ben Creer and honestly every single person who's come on the show and helped us out. Starting next semester, Sarah will not be a host. Yeah. Anymore, which is super sad. She's gonna be taking over social media, so she'll still be interacting with you guys, yeah. probably more than I ever will get to, but that's gonna be sad. So if you're interested, feel free to reach out to Ignite. We are looking for someone to fill that host role to try to. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, stop everything you're doing and like and subscribe, and then you're gonna comment, and then inevitably you're gonna click the little bell because you have to click the bell because otherwise you won't know when we post another video next semester. semester. Uh, this has been the pilot series of Ignite. I hope yeah. you enjoyed it. I guess we'll see you when we see you. See you later. Happy summer. <laughs>